Life is made up of moments. Some great ones, some terrible ones. Moments make up the man or woman. What do you do to prepare for that? What do you do when it has arrived? What do you do when it has passed? You don't make the moments. The moments make you. This is the Mwamba Moments. So, Mr. London, thank you for the night, first of all. It was amazing. It was amazing. But let's get it going. Um, yes. tell, tell us about you, something that we might not necessarily know, something interesting that, that, that not everybody knows about you. Uh, I can, can I get a little more on this one? I, um, what's something interesting about me? I don't know. I like, uh, I drive with both my feet. <laughs> really? So you use your left foot? But not. But I don't mean like stick shift. I mean like I can break with my left foot. You like know, you do uh, that on a regular or? What, what I realize. Sometimes you just, your, your right foot's tired and you use your left. What happens is I, I like uh, reading. So basically I, I, I read that if you condition your right side of your brain to do the opposites or the left, whatever you do with your right, if you get your left to do it, it creates patience. Are you trying to be ambidextrous? Yeah, but All for right. patience. All right. So me driving my left foot creates patience. That's awesome. That's all. I don't That's know. Awesome. This is, who gives a dog on about it? I don't <laughs> That's know. interesting, though. That's interesting. I don't here's think anybody knows another fun about fact. You. I fold my dirty clothes. A lot of people just take their clothes off and just throw them in a the hamper. No, not me. I fold. I, I got a thing with folding. But I'm not, I'm not really OCD because I don't like have to do it. But... I, this is what happened. This is a story, real quick story. Let's hear it. So, uh, growing up in high, growing up, um, I used to throw to wear my clothes and throw them in the hamper. I had to throw my clothes in the hamper. If my mom didn't wash, but I need to wear that shirt again, then I have to take the shirt out and iron it. I didn't like ironing, so I figured, well, if I take it off and I fold it, if I need to wear it again, then it's good to go. I'm gonna get that fly out. <laughs> okay. Black people, we don't like flies. We do not like flies. We always think we caught it, be like, ha! And then it catches around. We never catch it. Anyway, that's some fun facts, I guess. Cool, 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 cool. All right, let's stick it, let's stick it, let's stick it there. Okay. You growing up, all right? Because I believe that in order for anybody to reach a certain level, there needs to be a foundation. And the foundation usually be, you know, is set in your, in your phase when you're growing up. So right. how did you grow up? T take us back there. Uh, so I'm from South Central Los Angeles. If you don't know where that is, that's where all the black gangster films are shot. Boys in the Hood, Mr. Society, Colors, and so forth. Um, so for me, I um, grew up in church. My mom, really super spiritual. And um, I just remember like when I was 10, my mom prayed that, like, that God would keep me so busy that uh, I wouldn't get caught up in the streets. So could we stay next door to game members? We stay next door to game members, five houses down from another set of game members. Like, L.A. is based on games. So games was everywhere. Uh, so I was able to just kind of stay out the streets because, you know, part, partly because I was funny to the Crips. So they didn't, they didn't beat me up because I would do these impersonations sometimes and they would laugh and they, they didn't jack me so I didn't get robbed. So that helped. So honestly. your gift to saved your life. I in a sense. When I would do, because I was in high school, and they'd be like, hey, cuz, do the, do the scene from the such and such. Boom, it's not what you know, it's what you can, uh, <laughs> and that, that kept me from getting jumped. Okay, okay. Well, when we talk about dreams, right, I feel like you're living your dream. And for me, myself, it's, it's the same thing. You know, I'm living my dreams, being a professional athlete, and not a lot of people get to do that. But what is it when you were younger at that point? point in your life when you're growing up uh, what was what was your dream at the time did because I know a lot of people it changes you know yeah, as you was. grow for me I, at, at first I thought it was gonna be an uh, initially I thought it was gonna be an animator for Disney that was the first thought uh, and so it went from there to when I used to play drums in church and then I got into acting like uh, going into high school I started touring doing theater and then um 
that's when I was like, oh, I think I need to be doing, be an actor. I, I realized that at like 16. And then from there I started uh, working, doing plays or whatnot. And then, I mean, that's part of it. And then I went away to school and was working as a choreographer, teaching hip hop. And uh, I had, a, I had a, a gay roommate my second year in, co in college. And uh, I didn't know he was, I didn't know he was gay, or I, I knew he was gay, not from what, from what he said or how he acted, but he used to wear my clothes and take pictures in them. I was like, what you, and like I would drive back home, and I come back, and back in the days before he had phones, so he would take pictures of my clothes and then put them on his bulletin board, and he used to wear Victoria's Secret love spell. To this day, if I smell love spell, I think about college. I, I don't even want to say I think about him, but I think about college. So uh, I did some college, came back, and I started working professionally doing theater. So that's kind of my story. So, so doing theater, doing comedy, doing obviously acting as well is a, is a tough industry to, ca uh, to crack. What kind of advice would you have for the regular human being out there that's thriving to reach a goal that might be a, 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 in a saturated industry like yours? What, what, what's, the, what's the number one advice you would give? Uh, don't be afraid. I did, I, I booked ballers without any representation. I'd have an agent, I'd have a manager. None of that stuff. At the time, um, right before Ballers, this was Ballers is my second TV show series. I did another one called The Hustle on Fuse. And I played like a Brooklyn rapper in that. And um, so with the process, I would just tell people, man, don't look for, don't worry about the traditional route sometimes. Like sometimes it comes, we gotta be, whatever we ask for, we just got to expect what we ask for. Like we have, like, we got to have what, what they call like, I don't know how spiritual you are, but like in the Bible it says, it talks about like having childlike faith. You know, like when children ask you for something, or as you will know, because congratulations to you. Thank you. Uh, but as you know, like when children ask their parents for something, they don't ask, they say, hey, I want this toy for Christmas. But they don't ask, you know, do you got the money? Can you afford it? Do you got to work an extra shift? They just ask and then believe it. And that's the same thing I try to function from now, which is like, Whatever it is I want, I just focus on that. If it don't line up to the goal, I, I negate it. So it's about being focused, staying humble, and keeping God first. That's what I think. Focus. I think it's, it's, it's one of the most important attributes you need to have in order to reach yeah, you know, elite level in whatever industry you might find yourself in. Now, what, what drives you? What's, what's your passion? What, what drives you to keep going? Because, I mean, you got to be extremely disciplined. you got to be motivated, relentless in what you yeah. do in order to not only get there at the top, but remain there as well. What, what drives you? I think, um, I think my family does. It's, it's beyond me. Because, um, like, on a surface level, like, I, I got, my, you know, got my own place, got my car, you know, got my collection of shoes. I'm good, you know what I mean? But... It's a lot of other people that I look out for, so it's past me. You know, I still pay, you know, my mom's rent. Uh, my fam my fr I got friends I bail out of jail. My friends' cars get towed and all kind of stuff, you know, so it's, it's past me. So I realize that, I, once you realize, like, our gifts are not for us. Um, that's to me. That's the main thing. Our gifts are not, I think the people sometimes think that it's about you. us. You know, it's, it, it's like having a rental car. Who flosses in a rental car? It ain't yours. You got to return it. And I feel like gifts are the same way. So I'm just grac I'm grateful enough to even do what I do. So, so the least I can do is try to do, try to do things well. Okay. You know what I mean? Talk to me about, we had a really good conversation earlier, but you, you mentioned your family and who you do it for and your why, your reason, right? Um, that's extremely important. Yeah. Now, when, when we talk about these things, Talk to me about your family. Talk to me about your brothers and the reason why you do. And the reason why I ask is because I was in the process of changing teams not too long ago. And I sat down with a, with a coach and, and he was telling me, um, you know, he's, a, he's won multiple championships as a player and then as a coach as well. And I asked him this question. It was just random. And I said, hey, coach, which one was your favorite one? And so his answer was interesting because he talked about his, his favorite ring was the one that he won, not for himself, but for 
uh, a teammate of his, and he said he'll never forget that. But that's his most important one. And so I, from that conversation, I remember telling myself, man, like, it's more important. You can always achieve more when you're doing something for somebody else than you're doing it for yourself. Share, share that story that you shared with me. I think that a lot of times, like, a lot of people are insecure, bro. Like, uh, by that I mean, what I realize is that confident people lift up. Insecure people put down. Come on, come you know on. what I mean. So, uh, like that's why when I I walk around Tiff and people that want to talk to me about ballers or take pictures, or whatever, I'm really cool with that because I don't feel no type of way about you doing well. Yes. Like helping other people only speeds up your own success. You know what I mean. And so, for me, when people ask me, like I do photography, so not because I'm passionate about it, and I you know, but. I know that it's a gift because I haven't taken, I'm not, I haven't taken any courses, but I shoot well. And I know that I'm supposed to be giving that away. So when we can do for others and really do things without any like gain for that, gain back, like it, it does me fine to see others excel. And I try to push them to do that. Um, Cause I'd rather be a help. Like people say, um, People say money changes you. Not true. Money does not change you. Money, in fact, only brings out whatever was already there. It brings out the real you. So if you was, if you was selfish with a million dollars, you were selfish with 10. If you was a giver with 10, you're going to be a giver with a million. It, you know, I think that like a lot of times people are just caught up in the hype, but that's an insecurity because like, for example, we on two different paths. What's for you is for you, and what's for me is for me. So there's nothing, I, I can't, there's no reason for me to be mad at what you got, because that ain't for me. What happens is when people go after things that are not for them, it doesn't work out for them. And then okay. they be up there down the line talking about like why it's, it ain't work, it work, working out. You, it's like trying to use a Phillips screwdriver on a, oh, we got it, boom. Using a, a Phillips screwdriver on a flathead screw. It don't, it don't, it ain't gonna connect. You know what I mean? So I don't be tripping about that. If people got questions, I'll answer them. And if I can help them, I'll help them move forward, man, because I don't feel no type of way. You talk about like what's, what's, what's for you is for you. Um, it's very interesting. Again, just back on the topic of, of persevering, right? What's that fine line between I don't want to say quitting necessarily, but changing direction and, okay, let me keep going and pursuing this specific, you know, thing right. that I'm doing right now. I think that people always ask me, say, well, how do you know what your gift is? Right. The gift is basically, I had, a, I had an OG tell me this before, which is a gift is basically anything that you do very well with the least amount of effort. That's not, that's not by accident that somebody can cook or somebody can paint and, or, you know, uh, can cut hair really well. That's a gift. And I think that a lot of times people push it to the side out of maybe fear or whatever else. But for me, it's, it's knowing that when I wake up, two keys of happiness is do we like what we do for a living? Yeah. And do we like who we spend our time with? Right. And so when you understand those things, like for me, I can't wait to get up. I only sleep so I can do it all over again, not even for rest, you know, because I like, I like stand up. I like, uh, you know, acting and so forth. So your attitude changes, your approach to life, your perspective, how you interact. All of that is different when you do the thing that you love to do. So, I mean, if it don't line up with the goal, that's when you know you got to switch directions. Everything should line up to the end goal. Right, 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 right. I think, I think, I think everyone's seen that picture on, on Instagram, social media that, that talks about how, you know, what success really looks like, you know, which is a, a line that's kind of circular and it goes up and it goes down and it goes left and right and what people think it is, which is a straight line, which is the truth, right? It's not really just a straight line. Yeah. Talk to me about something that may have happened in your career and... Um, it might have looked like it was terrible. It might have looked like it was bad, but you might have grown the most in. 
the biggest lesson that you may have I've uh, learned in your career? Um, I think one is that I remember I did I did my first TV show called The Hustle. Mm -hmm. It did really well on Fuse. In fact, that was my first time in Toronto. I had to do press work for this like 2012 or something. Right. And I was star of that show, and it was going well. Then they cut it after one the first season. I was like, dang. It was like, yo, what happened? My lesson in that there are a couple of lessons. That was one of the lessons was. It wasn't supposed to last for more than three or four or more than one season because I was being set up for ballers. But I had to learn the camera because I was coming from theater. So I had to learn. That was my crash course onto TV acting or camera acting, film, so that I would be ready when ballers came. By the time ballers came, I was in a groove. I was, I was oiled because I had my training from the first TV show. That's one lesson. The other lesson was when I booked balls without an agent or a manager, I realized that, like, because everybody, everybody thinks that act, with acting, you got to have a manager and audition and you got to have them. And ballers came, they came, HBO was looking for me. And I'm in the cut. I'm not even, you know, I'm, I'm in South Central LA. I'm working clubs. I'm, you know, under the radar. I ain't got no real resume. But I realized that. Sometimes we should, when we ask for things, we just we need to make sure we're doing things to prepare for it, and d don't focus on anything else. Like I live my life in anticipation. I just expect things to happen, and I speak things to happen to the point where I'm very careful with how I speak because things happen. Like you know, anything from like, I mean, I don't know, man. The stuff I the stuff I ask for happen. And I just expect that. So I'm not even concerned about anything else. I don't even focus. It's like sometimes, like, guys will talk to girls, right? And the girl will be like, you know, I don't date. She may say, I don't date guys with yellow sweaters or that like to wear all black. I don't focus on that. If I'm interested, then I just work on accomplishing the goal. This is, this is a sidebar. This ain't gonna, let me hit you with this one. A lot of times, right, and we had to cut this out, but it's relevant. A lot of times, right, guys will talk to the... My whole thing is, like, let's focus on the end goal. A lot of times, guys miss out on getting the women that they want because their end goal is to sleep with the woman. Well, yeah, that's the, their, their whole job is to sleep with the woman, right? The end goal should be more so to make her comfortable first. If you make her comfortable... She'll do whatever she wants to do that's within her comfort level. Not sleeping with her isn't the goal. You know what I mean? But guys go up to a bar and they talk to a woman and they want to get, yo, so what you doing tonight? And she be like, back, as opposed to being kind, being a gentleman. So with that analogy, my point is this. Whatever the end goal is, if, it, if things don't line up to the end goal, we need not to do them. The end goal is to have a career to be working actor and so forth and create films. That means I need to be in classes, I need to train, uh, build relationships, stuff like that. Not money. People be chasing money. Money money doesn't make people happy. And people don't realize that until they spend their whole life chasing it and then they, you know, are still unhappy. That's why celebrities be committing suicide and all that. You can be like, these people got awards, cars, homes, travel, free planes. And they are still unhappy because money does not make you happy. It never, it never has. You talk, you're talking about the end goal. And uh, to me, you're really referencing focus, which you already talked about earlier. So how, you're a human being, right? Yes. And, and I'm saying this from experience as well. And, 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 you know, I'm a professional athlete. There's a lot of discipline that comes with it. There's a lot of sacrifices that, that's got to come to it. And sometimes you don't feel like doing these things that are necessary to be done to reach the elite level. What is your most important advice on focus? Do you, do you, do you have the right people around you? Is it about environment? It's all or is it like meditation? Is it it's like, discipline. how do you focus? Discipline. Uh, Dr. Johnson once said, like discipline is the ability to do uh, what you, the ability to do what you, that, What's the simple, let me simplify this. Doing what you need to do, um, we don't want to do it when it got to be done. 
So it's like being able to do that is a real sacrifice. Like I go to the gym, not because I like going to the gym five days a week. I, I'm not a gym rat. I hate going. It ain't what I do. But the reason I go is because I'm anticipating what's going to come of that. Um, the ability to do what you got to do at the, when you don't want to do it, when it got to be done. You know, I, I just, I take that. Dude, it's, a, it's all, it's mental. It's mental, bro. Because a lot of times, man, it's mental, it's faith, it's p- keeping the right people around you. Because you keep the, you, that's why people be talking. My, my mother told me, she said, don't tell everybody about what you got going on because everybody ain't happy for you. And people will, they, you tell people, yo, man, I'm thinking about pursuing and doing this. And they'd be like, oh, you can't do that. And it's like, no, you can't do that. But just because you can't do that because out of, you're afraid, don't project your fears onto me. Sure. But people do it all the time. That's why you got you to gotta watch negative people, man. Negative people will drain you dry. I, if people start talking negative, I'm out of there. So how, how, do you, how do you select your environment? How do you bring... How, what's that decision process like for you? Because, I mean, I think environment is one of the most important things. Again, we talk about how to be the best that you can be, you have to have the right people around you. How do you do that? Because it's important. Now, two ways, because I do stand-up, so I have to read people every night. Right. 150 people, okay. whatever it is. Okay. So even like when I deal with people... I can clock BS pretty quickly. They don't know that, but I do because I have to read a room full of people every night. So when I sit one on one with somebody, I can tell real quick. I said, "This person is insecure. This person is this, and this, this, and that." And that's not to be self aggrandizing, but that's just I, I understand that. So what I do is I filter people out. I, I filter people out based on what they can handle. So let's just say if we next we hanging out and somebody wants to come up and take pictures because they recognize me from the show. And I see a mood change. I don't trip. I just say, okay. But what I'm doing is I'm making notes because our reputation is based on our consistency. It's the same way the way I dress. Some people say, man, we really like your style. If I want to be known for the way I dress, I should be dressed fairly often, dressed well fairly often so that it becomes a part of me. It's the same way with character. If I start noticing that, yo, you solid on this meeting, the next time we get together, boom, 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 you cool, you cool. I'm like, boom, building track record. So our behavior, right, causes this meter. And once I start noticing, like, let's say somebody comes on, want to take a picture, you get jealous, or you say, he ain't nobody. I say, okay, his, his energy off. It, people, will, people always would tell us who they are. We got to listen more. That's why, you know, I, you know, if they're comfortable enough, they'll, they'll always be comfortable. But if they're not, you'll tell. Put, it's applying pressure. You can really see where somebody is from how they are under pressure, whatever that is. If they, if they can't handle pressure, then they'll crack. And so I, like I, like, I, I wait for that. I like that. I like that. Let's, what is your greatest accomplishment the one that you're most proud of you know I, people probably from the outside probably man like he's he's on the show ballers what what is it for you um your greatest accomplishment i think my grace i don't think i've achieved it yet um honestly i mean it's cool to do things like i wake up i get paid to do what i love to do right you know that's making it really is that i don't have a day job this is it i'm all in so I better be focused. Um, but my greatest accomplishment, I don't think I've, I've done it yet. But I do like little things like, for example, when my friends need help, I can help them. I really like doing that. Um, or when people want pictures and I can connect with them on that level. Because people ain't got to talk to me. Uh, so that's cool. I appreciate that. You know, so uh, I don't think I've done it yet, though. That's good. That's good. That means you're forward thinking. Uh, before we close everything up, cool. I got a couple more things. One, what is the biggest misconception about your profession? Because you're in the public eye. People see you all the time. And, and as a lot of people know, what you see on TV isn't always the reality. What is the biggest misconception that people think is really happening, but it's not? 
couple things. They think I make Dwayne's money, and I don't. <laughs> Definitely don't make nowhere near his money. Uh, they think I'm just balling, and I'm like, I'm not balling. I'm I'm just paying, catching up on bills. I'm catching up on, uh, you know, I'm not balling. You know, the most uh, the most expensive thing I probably have bought maybe was like. Uh, I don't know. I, you know, I don't really buy that. I, I buy tennis shoes or something. That ain't really, you know. Uh, but I think it's that. And then I think, well, currently with the show, they think, I think people think that actors are like obnoxious or rude. Like that's a, that just comes with being like an actor. That just comes with it. But that's not true. That's an insecurity. So I like when people walk up and they think I'm going to be rude to them. And I debunk all of that, break them all the way down to super cool. Let me take the picture for you. Let me walk to you. Let me, you know, I buy groceries for people all the time randomly. Because I know that people expect, and especially with the character I play, people think I'm Reggie. People want to fight and all that stuff. Well, not so much now, but season one, they want to fight. But I like being super regular. Because nothing... You demand respect with humility. Mm. They can't touch it. Talk to me, London. When I when I when Ballers came out, oh y'all still here? I didn't know y'all was here. It got. <laughs> I see so many empty chairs. I didn't. I know he's not here. No, no, it's just a real deal. When you when you function out of humility, and because you got to watch people. Some people do the humble brag, which is they're coming. They talk. Watch these people. They do this. They say, uh, "Hey man, how you doing, man? Yeah, man, God is good, man. I got a brand new house." Two cars, man. I just got back from Tahiti. That's false humility and, uh, right there. You know, but God is good. You're like, that ain't, that's a humble brag. Do not mess with these poisonous people. But humility is really being able to, like, for example, the show dropped. Ballers came out. I'm filming and everything. I didn't say nothing of nothing until it aired, right? And being able to practice that. Is a, is a real strength. People look way stronger being low key than the reverse. Like, even when, uh, just like when you see, when you see guys get emotional about whatever, if, if, if a dude is with his girl and other guys are looking at his girl, the guy looks way cooler. I mean, you say, yo, hey, man, that's your, that's your girl. I'm trying to talk. Oh, yes, that's my lady, man. Oh, no disrespect. As opposed to the guy saying, hey, man, why are you looking at my girl? And you didn't. I practice self-control as much as I can under the umbrella of humility. It's a better look because I think that a lot of times, this is why you got girls on Instagram with the have news and all of this stuff that they do for attention. I mean, this is a deeper, this, now we're going into psychology of fatherhood and all the other stuff. I won't go into that. <laughs> but my point is, is that the attention that thirsty people want will come to them if they moved in their strength, whatever it is that you're good at, do that. And that's going to give you all the notoriety. It's going to bring whatever attention it's going to bring the cameras. Just be good at the thing that you're supposed to do. That's, that's way better. So, I mean, practicing humility is, is crucial, bro. Especially the, the more you get, it's easy to get wrapped up if you think, it's, you think that you did it by yourself. Mm -hmm. That's silly, bro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody does it by themselves. That's, I don't even know how to, I don't even function in that, bro. I don't even do that. That's why I make sure when people want to take pictures, I stop and I do it as best I can without being late because it just reminds me to keep this stuff grounded. That's why I feed the homeless. I go and I photograph the homeless and I deal one on one. This, let's get to it because as we spoke about, like after you, after you strip away and you eradicate, all the ephemeral surface ideas. Who are we without the title? That's who I'm trying to connect to. So if you come in with something fake, I'll break you down because I know I know that I know that thing. That's not that's not honest. I don't know how to function in that. I go into all the tip parties and I run into people, and like I said, they they cool one event, not cool the next. I don't know how to do that, bro. It takes so much energy to be fake. That's why I don't even... Just on the logic, it's a lot of energy to go around pretending. 
Facts. That's an insecurity. Figure out what you do well within yourself. You're going to be stronger that way. Everybody ain't supposed to be funny. Everybody ain't supposed to be, you know, I'm a thin guy. There's no way I'm going to try to stand next to you with a tank top on and try to be you. That don't even make sense. Your strength, I'm just saying on a, something surfacy. boom, you got arms and traps and you got a neck and then all this extra. Sh- you got one too, man. You got a neck too. But what I, what I know I got is, like when guys start talking about the things they got, I got a car, I got this, or I'm coming up, hey, man, you know, I'm on ballers, you know what I'm saying? I'm on ball. No, that's an insecurity, bro. I don't need none of that. I, don't talk, I ain't never talk about ballers. Let people mention it. I don't talk about nothing I got going on because I know that what I got on the inside, that's going to connect, bro. That's because it's the truth. So I'm not worrying about trying to win people over with these fake, you know, this is what I do talk. I don't do it. It's, that's, it's really corny to me, actually, bro. Talk, talk, talk to us about what's that foundation coming from? Like, I, I sense a lot of, like, God, foundation. It's all God. Your, how much of your, is your faith it's part God, of, bro. of I know who it's you've God. become and God, played bro. a role in who you have become? It's God. My, mother, my mother's real low-key. You know, it's logic, though. Don't tell everybody what you got going on because everybody ain't happy for you. Keep people out your business. Keep it low-key. If it's the truth, it's going to reveal itself anyway. It's, you, you, people going to find out I'm on the show. They're going to find out that whatever it is, you know, you know uh, I've been around guys, right? Now, I'm going to give you this for free. The clone I'm wearing smells incredible. I'm going to just tell you that now. You can, you can have that. That's for free. I, and I put money on that. But now I make my, I make my, my smell, you know. But sometimes I'll be next to a guy and... A girl will be like, man, somebody smells good. He say, oh, it's me. It's, that's me. I'm like, I know it's not him. But I'm not going to get into a debate about smelling good with him. Practicing that humility scent. She's going to find out when, after she leave out of this club or after she leave out of here or whatever, she's going to walk past me or I'm walk past her. And she'll know. It's never about none of that stuff. This is all under the, you know, under the idea this stuff is God is bigger than me. I'm just, I'm just a guy. My gifts are um, it's a rental. This is. We gotta always treat the things that we get as if they belong to God. They're not mine. They can be taken away. I could be in a, you know, anything can happen. And God forbid, I don't take none of this stuff for granted. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna end it with this. And um, I know you had a long day. You know, shout out to Karen again, who got us connected, our PR. Yeah, shout out to Karen, man. But I, I really, I believe, in, I believe in evolution. I believe in, you know, people say people don't change. I think that people do change. People evolve. Yeah. People get better. Um, and you shared a story with me earlier when uh, you were talking about your siblings. And, and to me, I felt like that was one of those moments in your life that, you know, molded you. Um, I, because I, I really want this to be real. I want this to be raw. And I, I really want people to really go away leaving with something tonight. Share that with everyone. So um, in 2015, I'm from South Central LA, as I mentioned. Uh, I grew up being the oldest of five. It's three boys and three girls. Um, so my, obviously my name is London. I have a sister named Paris, another named Asia, another brother named August, one named April. My youngest, or the middle brother was named Wendell. Named after my stepfather. And so we stayed in a really gang-infested area. And um, in 2015, my brother played ball. He was in college and so forth. Long story short, my brother came back to L.A. for trials for the Los Angeles Lakers. He was going to try for one of their teams, D-League or something. And um, 25. And my brother was murdered. I shot 14 times. Uh in the hood and, and watch. And so um, people ask me, say, well, how was that and what that was like? It was like the best year of my life and the worst at the same time. And um, what made it interesting was because my brother was, he, we, was, we didn't grow up involved in gangs. We knew gang members, but we didn't grow up in that because we don't come from that. And so he was, he was shot down and he passed away. And so people were just like, you know, what happened? Or how did you get through that? Because two nights after, maybe a night after, I was in a club and I was working. And 
uh, well, how do you get through that kind of thing? I think because, you know, people, you know, people were praying for me because I, wouldn't, I don't know. You know, we all, we all go through that whole thing. But I think one of the changes that happened out of that, one of the positive things is I became a, very, a lot more passionate person. Uh, very passionate, very driven, very focused. And so now everything I do, I try to do it very well, whatever it is. You know, um, I, just, I just want things to be done well. Especially, like, I don't cook. Well, I cook. I don't like cooking. But, and y'all go to the, you go to my Instagram, so you're not, no, I'm not just some guy making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. But, like, the reason that people say, why you plate, because I plate my food. Right, I played it and it looks decorated and stuff. People say, "Well, why do you do that?" You know, but I feel like if I'm gonna do something that I don't want to do, I should probably do it well so that I don't waste my time. So my approach to things is to just execute them well and make that a part of uh, make that a part of me. And I got I got that from that situation. It just made me like refocus and regroup. Uh, so that was one of the positives. My family is still pretty strong. But that's why it hit me so hard when Nipsey uh, was murdered. You know what I mean? Because I just connected to Nipsey in, in that kind of way. Um, and we didn't hang out like that, but when we worked together, I knew he was very solid. And my brother was solid, and I just felt that same kind of thing, like his passion, just very driven. And I'd I be on that same thing. So, you know, my family is why I do a lot of the stuff I do, you know. Um, I just try to represent my mom well, you know what I mean? I don't want to embarrass her. So all of that ties into family. My stepfather's still alcoholic, crazy, you know, but, you know, that's the family. You feel me? I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you, London, man. Um, thank you for sharing, you of know, course. these stories, yeah. these deep stories, these real stories. Because at the end of the day, you know, the reality is that, you know, whether you're in the public eye or a regular human being, you're you know, reaching success or you're thriving for success. You know, a lot of things are gonna happen in your life and, and through this talk, what I take from it is that you're a victor. Because at the end of the day, you know, these things happen to everybody. Right. And you have to make the decision to choose whether you're gonna be either a victim or a victor. And you chose victor. And uh, I appreciate you sharing these things as well. That's 100%, um, bro. What, what we're gonna do right now, we're gonna open it up to a few questions and Q and A's. If they ain't sleepy, yeah, yeah, I know y'all tired. <laughs> we're gonna share. So, go have you a beer. We're gonna ask a few Q and A's. Y'all did, did get some personal stuff though. You got some. You got some personal. Some, some real stuff. You got some real personal. I stuff. I really appreciate that. No, cause that's one hundred percent, bro. Um, we got we got one over here and one over there. Sure, let's and let's go for it. You, cause so, I don't know when I'm gonna open up again. I'm gonna go back in my clan. Come, come on down. Actually, get up and just uh, beep, beep, beep. go ahead. Who's been an inspirational like actor or actress? Who's been an inspirational actor, actress um, in your life? One, one was um, Lorenz Tate. Lorenz Tate, uh, if you guys don't know, from Dead Presidents. Uh, Love Jones is one of my my favorite ones. He's in power. He's on power. So Lorenz Tate, I recently had a chance to work with him on a film called Back on two projects. One called Back to the Good Life, and his latest one I did with him and Lawrence Fishburne called. Bronzeville. It's an audio series that come out like next year, but working with, with Lorenz Tate, he's just a, a young black actor. I think it's very, very solid, still underrated. So he's one. Of course, um, Denzel. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I just think he's so good, man. Like, like, like there's only one Denzel. Like there's no other actors may kind of, there's one Denzel. He's just so whatever you know, whatever he's talking about, uh, he's rarely uh, clear about it and, and 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 precise about it. I just think he's just so cool. But also, the lesson what I got from his acting is that, well, real quickly, we watched Denzel do all the. He was a good guy for all the movies. Then we saw a switch. Boom! He reinvented himself with Training Day. We was like, oh shoot, he can play the bad guy. Totally different light. Flipped it again. With the action with Booker Eli, we was like, oh, he can do combat. Hence the equalizing all of those. Flipped it again, two guns with Mark Wahlberg. To, to keep that kind of relevance and, and grow for himself. And then he also comes from theater. I mean, like, it just shows you that there are these kind of levels. Then you got cats like Will Smith. Will Smith's career, you, 
when you watch his Instagram, you, you, I think a lot of us, we, I thought I was living life until I saw his life on Instagram. I want to take mine, ball it up, and just like <laughs> inflame it because I was like, oh, that's living. Like every time you look at Will Smith, he's on his way to fun. He's coming back from fun. You'd be like, he has a family. His family's still there. He's still working and filming. So it's still in shape, all these kind of things. Um, so those are, those are a few where I'll be like, I watch these guys. I'm like, I got it. When you watch people do what they do well, it just lets you know, like, dang, I got work to do. That's why, that's the other, this is a very practical reason. This is why you can't be full of yourself. Like, don't get me wrong, I appreciate you guys watching Ballers, and it's great. And it was great. This, our, this was our final season. And that's great. But at the same time, I'm like, this is Dwayne's show. How can I, how can I be self agonizing a show that I'm a part of? It's Dwayne's thing. That's cool. I'm a part of it. But I'm like, yo, I still got other levels. I got to get my own thing, my own what you call it, and, and so forth. And so all those kind of things. But those are, not to be verbose, but those are kind of some actors that did it. We got a question over here. Hey. Uh, is it two-part kind of thing? I'm sorry if I missed it. The first no, no. part, uh, I know you said you didn't have a manager or anything when Ballers came out. How did the process go? Did they just come to you and offer you the role? Or did you just go to the okay. What was the process oh, like? So I got a call from a, um, a creator, producer named Chris Spencer. Chris Spencer is a writer for, he did Kevin Hart's Hollywood Husbands and so forth. He's a comedian, so he has his own show. Anyway. He called me and said, hey, HBO's looking for you. Have you auditioned for Ballers? I said, no, nah, this is 2014. I said, no, I haven't. He sent the information over. I went into audition. Um, I had a horse. I was, my voice was really bad. It was horse because I had been, at the time, I was working as a choreographer. And I was choreographing this project, so I had lost my voice from rehearsal. And I said, man, if you guys don't understand me, if you can't make out what I'm saying, please let me come back when my voice is better. They said, no, we got it. I did the audition. And I did like several callbacks. They got quiet for like two months. They didn't say, or like, no, about a month or so. It just went quiet. I didn't know what would happen. And then a month later, they called me. Or two months later, they called me and said, hey, we'd like to offer you the part. He's supposed to be reoccurring, which is, you know, for people who don't know, showing up maybe one or two episodes. They said, we like what you did. Uh, we're going to make you one of the leads of the show. And also, people asked, well, why is Fat Reggie? Name Fat Reggie, but you're not fat because it, initially it was a no. It's a deal. Initially he wasn't he was intended for someone heavy set, but they like my choices, and they decided to go with me. So that's why sometimes, as actors, they don't even know what they are looking for. They're looking for us as actors to bring these characters to life and show them what it is. Um, but that was my process. They I just kind of went in audition, and you know. And that's how that went down. And how do you think, I didn't know the story about your brother, how do you think that trauma transformed your attitude towards acting? Your I think it just made me more driven. Because the, I, the plan was this. Me and my brother were, go, or were both planning to make it so that we can help the family out. I had pushed this on to my siblings because I had a plan, which was you go do well uh, in basketball, and he was great. You go do that. I'm going to do this acting thing. We'll build the house together. and or We'll build the family unit, as you will, together. We'll both cover this. And so when someone close to you dies, it just makes you think about naturally how you want to be remembered. And I was like, damn, how do I like, because everyone had nothing but positive things to say about my brother and all this kind of thing. I was like, damn, I, 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 wanna, I want people to say that I was kind or that you know, I was compassionate. So that's how it affected my attitude, really. So. I'm going to take probably a couple more questions. One right here. Go ahead, Kamish. Oh, shoot. No, I get it. No, okay. <laughs> let's do it. No, let's do it. Who's asking? Kamish. Oh, okay. Right yes, here, yes. right here, right here. Just hang with us. I just find reflecting is a massive part of our growth. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, like, how did you reflect on your whole journey you could tell your younger self something, what would that advice be? To start ASAP. Like sometimes we, I grew, when you grow up, especially in, in 
growing up black, you, you or I don't even say black, but maybe in the '80s, it was just one of those things where you you had to be a lawyer, doctor, teacher, nurse, police officer. I think it was like five things back in the day. Maybe an athlete. I wish somebody would have told me in sixth grade, like, yo, you could be a photographer, uh, you could be a barber, you could be an actor. I didn't know that was the TV was esoteric. It was somewhere over there. But I wish that's the only thing. I would have done was I would have started this journey earlier. As soon as I felt like, oh, this is fun, I would have, I would have jumped on it immediately. That's what makes these people. This is why I had this conversation earlier. This is why Michael Jackson was such a genius. You got to think, this guy. This is just let's just talk about just we know all the issues. That's lack of balance. But what I'm saying is that if from the age of five, all someone told you to do was just football or just whatever it is that you do. You don't have to worry about what to wear in the morning. You don't have to worry about food. You don't have to worry about getting to practice. You don't have to worry about somebody cutting your hair. You don't have to worry about trying to find a date, uh, high school tests. All you have to do is just focus on the thing that you do. Since five, all he's focused on is music. Of course he's going to be a genius in his 20s. That's all he did every day was that. But the flip side, again, things are in balance. So if that's all you do, you got to have some other things so that you are functioning in balance. So for me, I would have told myself, start today at 12 or whatever it was. Start today. Go. Last question. Last question from my man over there. How do you get in character? What's your process? What's your routine? What's your routine? Um, it depends. I did a project that's on Amazon Prime called Asia A. You guys get Amazon out here? Yeah, so, uh, no, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't know, because we couldn't even find HBO, to, exactly, so, exactly, can you slow her down, thank you, black people don't give you no chance to make, no mistakes, so my process is this, depends on what, what it is, when I did, uh, I did this project called Asia A, um, uh, and that's part of why I'm here, because in the States, I have a project that's circling the, the uh, film festivals. So I try to support films, uh, independent films. So in Asia, I played a paralyzed athlete um, and coming to terms with that. With something like that, I'm still on, I still practice method acting, which is like just being able to pull from real life. That's what I get into. And sometimes it ain't even about pulling from things that has happened, but I try to be very, very present. My process of being very, very present is making sure I'm totally off book. Off book is a term that actors use that means just doing all your lines. So I try to make sure that I'm completely off book so I know the lines. When I know the lines, I learn the lines not by memorizing and saying, um, I'm, sitting on a, I'm sitting on the stage, I'm sitting on the stage, sitting on the stage. Some actors do that. I don't do it that way. I memorize the lines emotionally. What's going on through a script emotionally? And that's what I work on. The lines will come if I know where the lines are coming from. So this is part of the process. So learning the line, like I said, learning the emotional beats, the lines lock in, and then once the lines are locked in, when I'm on the scene, then I can be present. I can't be present if I'm concerned about the lines. Then you're not going to find the magic. And magic is what we call, like, moments. Moments are like these real-life beats. You ever, like, watch, uh, you, like, watch a film and... You get choked up or you feel what the actors feel, those actors are present. That's why you become present. So when, when we see, we watch TV and be like, that guy can't act. What we're really saying is they're not present. Anytime, that's why we like Denzel. That's why we like the, the George Clooney's or whomever it is that we watch. We like their, mo their beat for beat, moment for moment, their existing Acting is not acting. People think you, the funny thing is you, you take acting classes, people think you take acting classes to learn how to act. You take acting classes to learn how to not act and, be, and, and to be in, in, the, in the now. So when people say, man, they, they always apologize for, man, I ain't like your character, man. I'm sorry, man. I'm like, listen, I, I don't need an apology. You're, you're not supposed to. And people, then the other flip is people come up and they want to give me, man, that means, you know, that means you're doing a good job. I know what it means. I'm, I'm trained. This is why I do this. I want you to be emotionally invested in somebody like Reggie. Because I know that, I know, one, it's not me. When I meet you, I know that it's not me. So I, I have no problem going all the way there. Because when you sit on one-on-one -on -one with me, then you know I'm not like that. But I know that. 
So I don't mind going there because I know who I am. So because some people, some actors go there and they can't come back. No, I'm not, I don't do that. I, I like to be me, you know what I mean? But yeah, so if you guys haven't seen Asia A, then you'll see that I'm not like Reggie and it's a short, totally dramatic, you know. Man, thank you so much, Lonnie, No, of man. course, thank brother. Thank you so much for everything. I know thank you I guys grew. for sticking around, man. I know it's late. I know, you know I, know, to do I, this. Know, I know I grew a lot even just sitting down and talking with you and, and my wife will attest to this. I always say, you know, my life mission is to grow and help grow and... Um, um, uh, thank you. Thank you for giving us everything that you got. And uh, uh, last question. Yes. And, you know, when you're done with this, you can drop the mic. What you got coming up? Any projects, anything on the, on the horizon? Right now, uh, it's just getting back on the road, doing stand-up and working the clubs, getting the material together and all that good stuff. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a project called Bronzeville, directed by Lawrence Fishburne. Lorenz Tain is in it. I think it's on the second season. And it's like a... Um, an audio series. Um, what do you call it when you can listen to like audio series on, on your phone? Like, what do you? Podcast. It's like I don't know if it's a podcast. Podcast. Yeah, maybe oh. it's like an audio book. I don't know. It's like acting, uh, audio acting. I don't know what you call. It. But anyway, I play a, a ruthless character on on this season two of Bronzeville. That should be out next fall. Um, there's always something that can. I just auditioning and reading scripts. I got to get back to something when I leave here. So. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad y'all was able to stick around. I appreciate it. Cause I know it's late. Don't, trust me. I know it's late. I know y'all didn't have to. None of that. You didn't have to come here. You got plenty of tiff events to go to. So uh, I thank y'all for keeping it, you know, for keeping it a buck and being here. So thank, what do y'all call a dollar here? What, what, what's a buck? Loony. Thanks for keeping it a loony? <laughs> That's what's or up. Say a That's what's up. That's 100%, bro. Man, thanks a lot again. Thank man. you. I wanted to share the stage with you, man.